Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. The Bible study where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Good morning, Dickie Lee. Looking forward to seeing you in a, in a few weeks, not too long. Good morning, Cynthia. Hello, Bonnie. God bless you. We... Uh, are studying today in Psalm 97 and 98. Will Jesus actually physically return <laughs> to the earth? Psalm 97 and 98 are both apocalyptic in nature, speaking of the rule of God that will one day physically come to earth. And there are teachers today, and not fringe uh, influences, fostering this general trend to de-emphasize the teaching of the coming of Christ and the rule of God physically on the earth. These chapters, however, speak eloquently in contradiction to that thinking. And uh, you say, well, I don't know anybody that teaches that Jesus isn't coming back. When's the last time you heard somebody make the joke, are you pre-trib or post-trib? Well, I just think it'll all pan out in the end. That is a very unscriptural and impious response. That There is nowhere in the scripture where we're encouraged to take that attitude. It's an attitude of despising, scorn, and mockery of those who take eschatology seriously. And part of that is because in the 60s and the 70s and even before then, people would get wore out uh, bashing one another about different beliefs about the end times. But just because it can be a difficult subject doesn't give us permission to take that tongue-in-cheek attitude about the return of Christ. And so as we study these chapters today, we're going to give some thought about the coming of the Lord, the nature of the coming of the Lord, beginning with Psalm 97, the entire song please yes sir the lord reigneth let the earth rejoice and let the multitude of the isles be glad thereof clouds and darkness are round about him righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne a fire goes before him and burneth up his enemies round about his lightnings enlighten the world and the earth the earth saw and trembled the hills melted like wax at the presence of the lord at the presence of the lord of the whole earth if there's any question about who's in charge on the earth, it's the Lord. <laughs> the heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Confounded be all they that serve graven images, that boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all ye gods. Zion heard and was glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoiced because of thy judgments, O Lord. For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. I hear you singing. Ye, um, ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. The Lord reigneth. The Lord reigneth. Let the earth, earth rejoice. rejoice. Let, Let the, the earth, earth rejoice. Let, Let the earth rejoice. Let the people be glad. For our God reigns. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> We're doing it again. You, carry on. You, you get these. It's our karaoke. It could be better. Uh, Psalm 97 is understood by almost all commentators to be a prophetic psalm authored by David. According to Finnis Dake, verse 1 contains the 75th prophecy of the book of Psalm. Now, who cares who Phineas Dake is? Well, let me tell you something about Dake. Dake is one of the commentators, the only commentator that is broadly known, who was renewalist in his theology and had experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so if you're going to be reading and studying in the scripture. Um, a lot of people today, they just kind of poo-poo the commentators. But let me tell you something. I have a lot of respect 
for the commentators that in years past, many of them before the day of the printing press, uh, wrote uh, intensive commenta com commentaries on the Bible. One of my favorites is a man by the name of John Gill. John Gill. He uh, He's just very erudite. And I, I like I say, I just so respect them because this was before you could have the entire library of the world in the palm of your hand, literally. Uh, and uh, their love for the Word of God. I mean, some folks, uh, nobody that's listening to our broadcast, uh, they spend more time reading Facebook than they do their Bible. And uh, so uh, Dake, being a renewalist, spirit-filled, tongue-talking commentator, he gets my attention. There's a book, uh, a Bible version out that you can get for him and called the Dake's Annotated uh, Bible. A Pentecostal friend of mine, when he was a young man, he, he went into the bookstore and said, I want one of them Dake's Anointed Bibles. <laughs> <laughs> well, all the word is anointed. Uh, but Dake has some interesting things to say. Uh, but Dake declares, observes that verse 1 contains the 75th prophecy of the book of Psalm. Speaking of the millennial age, when all the earth will rejoice and repose under the direct rule of God. Now, verse 1 of Psalm 97 connects with verse 9 of Psalm 98 and indicates that this is something that has yet to happen and will take place after the Lord comes to judge the earth and the peoples of the earth. According to Dake, there are 14 characteristics of the millennial age. And if you get the written copy of this, uh, either off of our website or our Facebook page, you can look up Father's Heart Ministry and see the notes there on Psalm 97. But according to Dake, there are 14 characteristics of the millennial age, which scripture indicates will commence in the seventh epoch, thousand year day, from the creation of Adam approximately 6,000 years ago. Hence, this is an ominous prediction for our day. I look very closely at our lifetime. You know, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, and it's been 2,000 years. <laughs> but we are in the sixth, at the conclusion, actually, of the sixth thousand-year period, moving into the seventh thousand-year period, and the seventh day is God's day of rest. And the millennial age is typified as the fulfillment of God's Sabbath. And so we're really in the threshold of something. I don't know exactly the years because the Gregorian calendar, there was there was an error of three and a half years somewhere around the time of Jesus' birth. And, uh, but we're getting right at that point. And here are the 14 things that, that Dake observed are descriptive of what, life on this planet will be like during the millennial age. Number one, all nations will give glory to God. There mm -hmm. are scriptures referencing this in the written version of the study that I just mentioned. Number two, all nations will go up to the temple of Jerusalem to worship God. The Dome of the Rock uh, will not be there. Uh, number three, all the earth will fear God messengers among the nations will declare the reign of God. And that sounds like you and I ruling and reigning. Uh, the world of men will be established and unmoved. There will be no war. There will be no danger of any kind. There will be no fear of any kind. Uh, men will be ruled in righteousness. In other words, for a thousand years, man will not have an option to sin. He will not have opportunity to sin. Uh, heaven will rejoice because the will of God will be done in the earth. Heaven will not be a place of warfare like the angel that told Daniel he was resisted by the prince of Persia, mm -hmm. that the angels for the first time since creation will not be at war in order to gain access to bless the lives of men. The earth will be gladdened because of the glorious blessings of God. Romans 8 talks about that, the manifestation of the sons of God. Righteousness and truth will fill the earth according to the scriptures. God's enemies will be destroyed. There will be great physical changes in the surface of the earth. And there will be universal worship of God. And Israel will be restored, delivered from the Gentiles, and converted to Christ. 
and God will be exalted above all gods. We'll talk a little more about that in a moment. Now, verse 2 says that, verse 1 says, the Lord reigneth, and then verse 2 says, clouds and darkness are round about him. When you see that word clouds, you need to think of yourself. You need to think of those who have gone on before. There are several verses that compare men to clouds. 2 Peter 2.17 and Jude 1.2 uh, talks about men who are clouds without water, false ministries, no spirit, no word, water in them. Well, if there are clouds without water, then there are clouds with water. Uh, Matthew 24, 30, Jesus said he's coming in the clouds. That's very interesting because uh, there are verses, and I'll read one here in a moment, uh, and teachers that suggest that Jesus is coming in us before he comes for us. Mm -hmm. And Matthew 24, 30 seems to suggest that. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, I think it is, outright, set, outright declares it. And we'll get to that in a minute. Zechariah 14.10 specifically speaks of the bright clouds of God, uh, not as a weather phenomena, but rather the raising up of carriers of the glory of God who will be used mightily in the earth in our time. Zechariah 10.1 says, Ask of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, and the Lord will make bright clouds and give them showers of rain, everyone grass in the field. And those clouds are, that's not something ethereal. Those clouds are people, carriers of the glory, people filled with the word, filled with the spirit, out of which, as it was with Jesus in uh, Jerusalem, when he walked in Galilee, they'll be full of the spirit of God flowing out of them into the earth. Verse six, talk says there will be a time that the earth will see the glory of the Lord and rejoice, that the whole earth will see the glory of the Lord and rejoice. All the people shall see his glory. Now, if all the people are going to see his glory, where is his glory? Mm -hmm. His glory is in you. Amen. Colossians, in other words, all the earth is going to see what God put in you. Colossians 1, 26 and 27 says that the glory is in us. This gives us a sense that God is coming in us in glory before he comes for us in the parousia, the rapture, the manifestation of the sons of God, whatever you want to call it. 2 Thessalonians 1.10 says, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all of them, he's coming Matthew 24, 30, coming in the clouds to be glorified in his saints, admired in all of them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. That's what the scripture says in Hosea 6. It said, the Lord will come unto us as the morning and then shall we know as the former and latter rain on the earth and then shall we know if we follow on to, the, to know. So whatever that coming is, it's it's walking out the coming of the Lord, something that God is bringing into the earth in an outpouring of his spirit that's going to be as distinct uh, from business as usual as it was in Jesus' day when he came and established the first century church. And that's if we follow on to know, don't turn back. You don't want to turn back in a time like that when the glory is outpoured upon the earth. It's a time of a great harvest. Well, and what keeps you from following on to know? Distractions. Mm -hmm. Anything that keeps you from seeking first the kingdom? You know, Kitty always asks that question. What is? What was the enemy trying to get us off of whenever he sent that little distraction to us? Yeah. Distractions of problems, distractions of people, distractions of life. Uh, the enemy's number one job is to divert your attention because he knows that you are where your attention takes you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to be prepared to follow on to know because at the time that God is doing something, there will be great distraction and you have to make a decision. I'm going to follow on to know the Lord, which means you're going to have to leave the familiar and step into the unfamiliar, be willing to get out of your head, be willing to walk into uncharted territory in God. You know, the people that say, well, God never speaks contrary to his word. What they are really saying 
is that they believe God never speaks contrary to their understanding of the word. Amen. That statement it implies that the person that believes that believes that they have perfect understanding of the word of God and that person is very foolish in thinking so. Yes, it's true. In theory or in reality, it, God will never speak contrary to his word, but we, he will often speak contrary to your understanding of the word because if you want what you've never had before, you must be willing to go where you've never been before. And if you're going to go where you've never been before, you must be willing to be following an impetus and a leading of the Spirit that is not common fare in the pulpits of the Western world. You must be willing to hear something that you can say, I don't understand that, but I know it's God. See, some people think if they don't understand it, it can't be God because their God is in their head. They have a mental God. No. But the Bible says in Isaiah, you'll go out with joy and be led forth with peace. It didn't say you'll go out with understanding and be led forth with intellect. Sometimes you have to check your intellect. You have to tell mm -hmm. your intellect to sit down and shut up and just obey God. Amen. Then shall you know if you follow on to know. Verse 7 talks about all of the graven images will be confounded in the millennial reign. All of those that boasted themselves as idols. Think about that. I mean, we even have American Idol. Now, <laughs> now I'm meddling. But we, we look at celebrities. The word celebrity means star. It comes from the worship of Astarte. The whole cult of celebrity in the Western world has its roots in pagan history and pagan traditions. These large lot. No, we don't fall down and worship a piece of wood. But are we worshiping at the altar or the cult of celebrity? Many people are. And we actually uh, equate the definition of something that is spiritual. It has to be something or someone that is larger than life because we've contaminated our understanding of God, the things of God, and the glory of God with the cult of celebrity. Just because it's shiny, the scripture says the love of money is the root of all evil. If you translate that, uh, more uh, specifically, it says the desire to shine is the root of all evil. Now you compare that to the cult of celebrity that so shapes our culture today. But it says that even the gods, the, all, worship him all ye gods in verse 7. <laughs> so it's saying there's going to be a time that every false dependency and every idol will be put down and the gods, Elohim there, the gods, well, wait a minute, I thought God is Elohim. Yes, he is Elohim, but that's not all Elohim is. Mm -hmm. The gods will worship him. The Elohim will worship the one true God. The term Elohim here applies to God in Genesis 1, but it has a broader application. And here's the definition. If you look it up, do a little study. The word Elohim means the creator, L-E-L, -E -L, and his pantheon, or to make it in a little simpler language, the father and his family. Amen. The father and his family. You see, Elohim is the tribal name of God. The surname of God. If you want to know what God's last name is, if he has one, it's mm -hmm. Elohim. Because like I'm a Walden, but Kitty's a Walden also. We are Waldens. So when the scripture says, you are God's, what he's saying is, you are Elohim. You are part of the Father and his family. Amen. And this is what was quoted by Jesus in John 10, 34, when he says... Uh, have you not read in the scriptures? They were mad at him because he made himself the son of God. He said, haven't you read in the scriptures? You are gods. And oh no, it's not me. We get this mock humility that's rooted in the vow of poverty mm -hmm. uh, and, false, and false denigration of the creation of God. You got to know who you are. See, this is why the writer of Philippians in describing the incarnation of Christ said this, who being in the form of God, he starts out by saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now I'll do something that I've never done on Morning Light. Say that with me. Let this mind, let this mind be, in you, be in you, which was also, which was also in, Christ Jesus. in Christ Jesus. Well, let's look and see what that mind was. Philippians 2, 6 and 7. Who being in the form of God, I am in the form of God. Amen. 
thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I am equal with God. I am God kind. You are God kind. Amen. See, Kitty is a Walden. She is Walden kind. I am Walden kind. And as Waldens, we are equal. She, I am not more of a Walden than she is. Mm -hmm. She is equally as much a Walden as I am. Mm -hmm. Now she is not, she may not be equal to me in relationship, and we could turn that around and think about your children. Your children, uh, if my children are Waldens, they are equally Waldens. They are no less Waldens than I am. However, in terms of relationship, mm -hmm. we are not equal. I'm the father, they're the child. Mm -hmm. Uh, my oldest son, he's going to be 36 this year. And, uh, uh, but I don't care. And I'm, I'm always 20 years older than him. I'll be 56 uh, this year, uh, this month, as a matter 24. of fact. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, he will, I don't care if he's 86 and I'm 106, he's, I'm still his daddy. That's right. And we are not equal by relationship. That's why. Moms and dads, you cannot be your fr the friend of your children. Right. You can't be their friend. You cannot be their friend and their father at the same time. Oh, or their mother. You, you want to be their friend. I want to be their best friend. Well, you have robbed them of a mother. You have robbed them of a father. There is not... See, friendship implies equity. But in terms of relationship, there is no equity between us and God. And there should not be equity between you and your children. You watch these sitcoms on television where the parents are absolute buffoons and the youngest children from the oldest to the youngest are the wisest ones that are telling everybody what they ought to do and being sane and, and uh, having Sorry. all the right answers to whatever's going on in the storyline. That's messed up. Uh, that's totally wrong, see? But yet at the same time, we are still God kind. We are the Elohim, the creator El. He's a papa. And his pantheon, if that, those of you know what that word means, uh, or his family. It's the father and his family. And in that respect, you are God kind. And of course, it's so funny how Jesus misquotes that verse. Jesus does things to the scripture that if I did them, I'd be called a heretic. Mm -hmm. Because the verse in Psalms that he's quoting is, it is said you are gods, but you shall die like men. And uh, in other words, it was a rebuke to high-minded people. But Jesus didn't quote it that way. He said, doesn't it say in your scriptures? <laughs> I love how Jesus proof texts uh, the verses that he quotes in direct opposition to how theology says we should be handling the word of God. It just makes me chuckle. <laughs> but he, he thought it not robbery. I'm not taking away from God. You're not taking away from God to know that you are God kind. You are one with the father and his family, equal with God. And he may, that's why, you know, if we're the house of God and we're railing on each other, let me tell you something. If somebody comes to my front yard, starts throwing rocks at my house, I'm going to come out and give them the fivefold ministry. Hello. And you think about God, you are sitting there railing on another believer and God lives in them. God's going to come out of his house and he's going to give you a whooping. <laughs> we need to remember who lives in you and who lives in those people around you. Well, are you saying they're not saved? Oh, no, I'm not saying that. Then quit throwing rocks at them. <laughs> See? He said, but he made himself of no reputation. You got to know who you are. You can not, yes, I'm of no reputation. Until you know who you are, you really can't be that, can't do that. Mm -hmm. Until you know who you are, you cannot lay down who you are in service to men. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. You know, I don't see anywhere in the scripture where God commanded a man to bow down or to humble himself to another man. No. The scripture, in all the scriptures on humility, it's about humbling yourself to God. No. Now, that doesn't mean you're any better than anybody else. But you have to learn there is a lot of manipulative, controlling tactics that are imposed. And unfortunately, Pentecostal charismatic circles, prophetic circles are really bad about this. The prophetic has a major bad reputation 
uh, William Branham, the most powerful prophet who has walked the earth in our times, who birthed the ministries of anybody that has mattered in the Western world from the 1950s through the 60s. But yet he got off in his lifetime. He died before his time. And my father saw him in a meeting one time. A little lady came up to him uh, in a meeting and she said, I have a word for you. And he said, what? Wouldst thou prophesy to the prophet? What's wrong with that picture? Mm -hmm. See, he thought of himself and I say that with all deference because I have great respect for who he was. But he got off because he... He began to demand others to so posture themselves before him in a way that he wasn't willing to posture himself before them. Mm -hmm. That's why leaders are all about washing feet. Leaders are in the foundation. We're here washing feet. We're here to be accessible. We're not here to step on toes. We're not here to lord it over you. We're here to relate you to the king. We're here to connect you to the creator L so that you realize you're a part of his family. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Verse 8 declares that Zion, remember the parched place, mm -hmm. will hear the worship of God in the earth and be glad. This is Zion as it applies as a metaphor of God's people and also natural Zion, a location in Israel where God's physical rule will be established in the earth. One of my favorite verses and one of my mentor's favorite verses talks about the government of God. For unto us, Isaiah 9, 6, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Now that's us. That's the body of Christ. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order and establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth, even now forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. Amen. And Isaiah wrote that in a, one of the darkest periods of Israel's history. And the disciples remembered it when they saw Jesus cleaning out the temple. And they remembered the zeal of the Lord's house has eaten me up. And uh, the kingdom of God, the government of God, the Greek word there is basileia, the influence. What is the government of God? It's the voice of God. Anything under his voice is under his influence. It's not like uh, geographical territory because the whole earth, all of creation belongs to him. The government of God is the voice of God, the influence of God in your life. Doing what you see the Father do is seeking first the kingdom. If you'd read verse uh, chapter 98, please, the whole chapter. Okay, verse 1. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation, his righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and with the voice of a psalm. With trumpets and the sound of a cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord the King. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together. Before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness, shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Now when he says with righteousness he will judge the world, what does that mean to you? 1 Corinthians one thirty says Jesus is our righteousness, our righteousness is a person. Amen. So he will judge the world by a metric that is measured in the person of Christ, who loved the world and gave himself for it. See, the question will be, what did you do with Jesus? He's not going to ask people all these other questions. It's going to be, what did you do with Jesus? What was your relationship with Jesus? Um, psalm 98 is a psalm with 12 admonitions for us. There are 12 things that we're admonished to do. It says, sing unto the Lord a new song. Make a joyful noise unto God. Make a loud noise. It's a noisy place. It's not too quiet. <laughs> so, well, God's 
God, you don't have to make all that all, all that noise. God's not deaf, but he's not nervous either. I'm not the first one that said that. <laughs> Sing unto the Lord with a harp. Sing unto the Lord with the voice of a song. Make joyful noise with trumpets. Uh, I had a prophetic I had a prophetic word that uh, when I turned 50, that it would be the beginning of a jubilee for me and that I would hear a trumpet and, and on my 50th birthday when we were like on the 26th floor of a hotel. And I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I heard a trumpet blast outside our window. And I went and looked, fully expecting to see an angel out there blowing a trumpet. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't. What's also interesting in the book, uh, that our next book that we are publishing, that uh, it's a prophetic perspective on the next 50 years. I did not know at the time I published this book that the rabbis and the authorities in Israel declared that this year is the beginning of a jubilee. So what I actually did in writing the book is write a book from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from jubilee to jubilee. Yeah. Wow. Uh, our, our October conference is going to be all about that book and the message in that book. 24 things that God showed me is going to be happening in the earth. And everybody that registers... For the conferences, the first thing they're going to get is a copy of that book. Mm -hmm. uh, powerful things that God revealed. And so we make a loud noise. We rejoice and sing praise. We sing unto the Lord with the harp. We sing unto the Lord with the voice of a psalm. We make joyful noise with trumpets. We make joyful noise with cornets, which is a form of a trumpet. It says, let the sea roar. In all its fullness. Have you ever heard the sea roar in worship? There have been times I've heard sounds coming out of a, uh, a company of people worshiping God that I know didn't originate anywhere but heaven. Mm -hmm. It says, let the world roar and all that dwell therein. The world is designed to roar in praise to God. The voice of many waters. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together. Now, the reasons for why we should do these things in Psalm 98 is, number one, because God has done marvelous things. He has won the victory. Number three, he has made known his salvation. Number four, his righteousness has been revealed openly. Five, he has remembered his mercy and his truth toward Israel. His salvation has been manifest to all the people of the earth, and he is coming to judge the earth in righteousness and equity. So when verse 2 says that God will openly show his righteousness in the sight of the heathen, he is speaking again of Jesus himself because 1 Corinthians 1.30 and 31 tells us that Jesus is our righteousness in his person. Our righteousness is not a moral quality. Our righteousness is not a spiritual quality, folks. Our righteousness is a person. His name is Jesus, and he is in us saying to us, now you are clean through the word that I've spoken to you. Amen. Cleansing us and making us new and fit for relationship to God our Savior. Verse 3 tells us that in a time when all the ends of the earth see the salvation of God, during that time when the ends of the earth see the salvation of God, that he will remember his mercy and truth toward the house of Israel. This speaks specifically of Israel as a nation in the millennial age. There are themes in this teaching that have fallen into great neglect in the church, but they give us tremendous hope as we look at the instability of our times manifesting all around us. In verse 9, we see the 76th prophecy in the book of Psalms, declaring that there will be a time that God comes to judge the earth and set up his rule and his reign physically, not just metaphorically among men. Now, there is a strong contingency of teachers. I could give you a litany of names, and you would know every one of them as a household name, of teachers in the renewalist, prophetic, Pentecostal, charismatic, prophetic movement that do not believe in the physical return of Jesus to the earth. They forget the words of the angels. If you're one of those people and you don't think that Jesus is going to return physically to the earth, 
Remember the words of the angels at the Ascension in Acts 1.11. There is no ambiguity in what they said. You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. We are going to see him come physically. He's going to bring that body back that he took to the cross. He will come back in that body and he will be seen and he will be known. And if you hear anybody say otherwise, they are in some of the most dangerous territory I believe you can get in doctrinally this side of losing your salvation. I know that's a long, that's a powerful statement, but the scripture talks about the doctrine of Christ. <clears throat> that if someone violates the doctrine of Christ, you can't have anything to do with them. Now, I don't believe there's very few people that are in wrangled, convoluted, confused eschatology, teaching of the end times, that do cross what I call the bloodline and start messing with who G, who God is in Christ, messing with the doctrine of Christ. But I believe these that believe this, that Jesus is not coming back, that Jesus will not come back physically to the earth. I think that's as, that's as mixed up as you can get and as error prone and erroneous in your thinking as you can get this side of putting your salvation in jeopardy. Now, I know that's a strong statement, but it's true nonetheless. Verse 9 gives us a reason to rejoice because ultimately, that's why I believe it's so dangerous to say, well, I just believe it'll all pan out in the end and everybody chuckles. Mm -hmm. I got a big problem with that. Well, Brother Walden, what do you believe? Doesn't matter what I believe because to be honest with you, I'm more comfortable with my questions than I am with everybody else's answers. Mm -hmm. When I stand before God, I would be much more comfortable with an arm load of questions, a legal pad with all my questions than with all of the doctrinal answers that people out there are so sure of. Because, and, and, well, how can, you, how can you do that? Because my salvation is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, not in my doctrine. Am I saved because of what I believe? Am I saved? Who is, is my salvation a doctrine? Or is my salvation wrapped up in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who I, I've accepted as my Lord and Savior? Now, you need to stop and think about that. And if you think about that long enough, it'll make you very uncomfortable. <laughs> because there's a lot of people that believe a lot of things. That sounds pretty, pretty off-center to orthodox theology. But that doesn't mean that they don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The one exception is this, when they cross the bloodline. There is one God, 1 Timothy says, 2.8 I believe it is, says there's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. When the people mess with that, they're in error. And it says, have no fellowship with them. Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, and there are other groups. And they know how to talk to you. A Jehovah Witness and a Mormon will give you all the buzzwords and the lingo about Jesus, that they will do anything but truly admit what their doctrine believes about who Jesus is and who Jesus is not. I have personally had an upfront intimate encounter with the demon that lives in Mormonism. That's why God's greatest grace to us in the last presidential election and the one before that, when uh, the last one when Mitt Romney was running, God's greatest grace for us was not to allow Mitt Romney to become president because he's a devout Mormon. And you would have that demon and that principality would have been let loose on this nation with consequences that I think you could not exaggerate. Mm -hmm. So we better be thankful that God, you may not want to be thankful for President Obama, but you better be thankful that Mitt did not win. Against all odds, he absolutely should have won. He should have won the election. God spared us. Say, so, well, I don't, President Obama, he's a, he's a Muslim or whatever. I don't know about all that. I just know that the scripture says that God raises one up and he puts one down. Whoever sits in the White House, whoever sits in the White House, you can pull the voting lever, but God decides the outcome. And, uh, and we better be prepared for that lest we have an unscriptural attitude toward those you know, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote, let us pray for those that are in authority. 
and honor those because they bear not the sword in vain. He said that when Nero was burning Christians in his garden parties. And the early church was not a political church. The early church was not an activist church. I like what Warren Hunter said the other day. He said, uh, when you are breaking relationships with people who believe differently than you do in the political arena, it's because you have more of a political spirit than you do the spirit of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, that is absolutely true. Politics is a brothel. It's a spiritual brothel that the church prostitutes itself in when they ought to be on their knees and realizing their citizenship is in heaven. That doesn't mean you don't vote. But the church has been deluded, just like in Isaiah's day. He kept warning the king, you better quit running to Egypt to solve your problem. They saw the Assyrians coming down, the Babylonians coming down. And he says, you better trust in God. You better trust in God and believe God. You better quit looking to the world for your solutions. That's a whole other conversation. But verse 9 gives us a reason to rejoice. Because ultimately God's coming to judge the earth and to rule the earth. And the social systems of men, uh, he's going to rule them for a period of time before bringing all humanity to their disposition in eternity future. I love to read the Bible and go find that boundary where God quits talking. But you know, there's all eternity beyond that. And you could study the book of Revelation and you could study various, and we can't wait till we get there. Uh, and you could study various prophetic things and you see where we get to this place where uh, God is just, that's all he has to say. He's not saying anymore. That's all the information he's giving. But yet there is an eternity beyond that, that he will take every, listen, every man, woman, boy or girl who has ever lived and died on this planet from the day that he brought Adam out of the dirt uh, is going to spend eternity somewhere cognizant, aware, and experiencing their environment. And we don't think that way. We don't like to think that way. It's not popular to think that way in a seeker-sensitive uh, church that uh, is, is only focused on now, only focused on what's going on around them. Uh, it really helped me years ago when I read where Paul said, if we in this life only have hope, we are of all men most miserable. That's right. And I realized at that point, I was in my early 30s, that I had... I had strayed into this focus of just what's going on here and just what's going on now and just what's happening in the lives of people. And I was pastoring at the time, but I realized there was a fuller dimension of joy, a fuller dimension of hope that is anchored by living your life with eternity in view. This is a core truth of the word of God that cannot be dispensed of. And the reason we do dispense of it, because the world mocks. You go, <laughs> you ever watch how the news, when they talk about, or on, on, on the media, they talk about the Perusia, they talk about the return of Christ, and they see that as one of the most idiotic, simplistic, inane, impossible, stupid beliefs that Christians could believe. Even those that claim to be Christians and those that claim to be on advocates of conservative Christian uh, culture. But you start going into these themes, and they will pandered to you, they will pat your hand, you poor little simpleton. But let me tell you something, the return of Christ, the reign of Christ, it's a core truth in the word that we cannot dispense of. And it is in fact our great hope. And I believe because of the passage of time, and we're in that threshold between the sixth and the seventh millennia, I believe that uh we will be participators in this grand scheme as it begins to unfold as God brings his will to bear on the earth for eternity. Glory to God. Father, thank you for all these reminders about making joyful noises and playing with our instruments and um, trumpets and clapping our hands. Father, because when we fill up our mouths with the joy of the Lord and we sing and we praise you, we become a brighter light. And we want people to inquire of that hope, that light that's within us. Father, our highest hope is that we ooze the Spirit of God. If Christ in us is the hope of glory, and he is, we pray to start pouring out of our flesh upon all people, as the Holy Spirit declared in Joel, that people will inquire of that Jesus, that light, that bright, that hope, that joy, and we can turn them and make introductions to the Father through the name of Jesus. And we thank you for the privilege, Father, 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen.